Hello, this is Carl Seidel of People's View. Today we're going to start something uh, different that we hope to continue once a month during the year. We're going to be talking about some local uh, political issues, usually some things that go along with the budget and or some of the legislation that's going on. Today we have Senator Ke Kevin Avard and former uh, Alderman uh, Dave Shoneman. Okay. We're going to talk, we're going to start off anyway, talk about something with Nashua. And Nashua is going through a, uh, a problem now with the, with the uh, people reacting to the budget and everything that's coming, uh, going to cost us one way or another, either yes. directly or indirectly. <laughs> there is a, there's a reaction to the budget. There's always a reaction right. to the budget. But the biggest reaction is to property taxes. Mm -hmm. And property taxes, everyone got their tax bill a month or so ago, and everyone's taxes are, most people's taxes are up. Um, the administration will tout that the rate went down. And in fact, the rate did go down, mm -hmm. but the taxes that people are paying, the actual dollars has gone way up. Our, our taxes, for instance, mm -hmm. um, our assessment went up, my personal assessment went up about 50%, wow. and the tax uh, rate came down around 20, 25%, somewhere in there, I have to do the math. But um, our taxes, our actual tax dollars spent are increased by about 20%. And that's, that's typical. Um, the average increase may not have been 50% in their assessment, but many people like us have huge increases. And I know that um, a lot of folks were complaining on social media and whatnot, and I think it's good that they complain. I, there's been a lot of, a lot of complacency mm -hmm. with city spending. Um, folks don't get involved, and the Board of Aldermen is largely a rubber stamp. Even with some conservatives on there who want to put the brakes on a little bit, they're not able to do so because they're not in the majority. Right. So the spending just happens. And this administration, um, in my opinion, will do whatever they can get away with. Right. That's what they do. They do whatever they can get away with. They push it as far as they can, and they push the spending as far as they can. Um, We've talked on the show or on previous shows about the uh, the art center as an example, just as an example. Now, the art center, it looks like it's going to open up. It may be a success. That's great, but it's not an economic success. It's yeah. an economic disaster. That was touted as converting a shoe store to um, a theater for $14 million. Right. And instead, we knew that wasn't going to happen. They knew it wasn't going to happen, but that's what they sold the public. So instead, they tore it down, and it's not 14 it's $25 million. So here's a $25 million building that's costing the taxpayers significantly, and that's part of why these, um, these taxes have gone up so much. And will it be a success? It's, it's not going to make money. It's going to be a money loser and may get people downtown and some of the restaurants may be happy. And we hope that, that there is some measure of success, but, but it's an economic disaster. And a lot of things are happening in the city that really, if they boil, down, boil them down on an economic basis, you find that they're a disaster. And um, we, we all pay for that disaster. Mm -hmm. um, the state, I know we talked about this a few moments ago, the state is sending more money back to the city of Nashua than ever. Yeah. So I think City Hall is, wants to blame other people. Um, again, they want to they'll see what they can get away with. If they can get away with blaming the state, they'll get away with it. But the folks at home need to understand and need to look into this. Or at least just, just think about it and listen to us a little bit to understand that it's not the state's fault. Mm -hmm. It's local spending and it's on... on what I will still call a boondoggle um, because it's public money being spent for something that should be a private enterprise. And part of the problem is the transparency. Yes. We just don't get that uh, clear transparency on how, what they're doing. Yeah. You know, unless you're trying to listen in and, and go and uh, look up the records of, of what's happening. I mean, the records on this whole program of that uh, theater is uh, shows how many times they changed the way they were doing it, uh, right. how the how they were financing it. First, they had to get so much uh, donations. Well, they they couldn't get that many, so they eliminated that condition. Yes, then they did uh, something else about uh, how that how it was going to be built, and then now they're talking about putting up a parking garage there too, yeah. which is another several million dollars. So I, I, how, how are the, the local people going to enjoy this? I mean, they're going to go there. They're still going to have to pay for the tickets, even though they're paying through with their taxes. Mm. That bothers me mm -hmm. uh, because you know, somebody's, somebody's going to make some money, but it's not, it, nobody's going to be benefiting financially as, as far as the taxpayers are concerned. Now, you had mentioned that, the, um, Dave, that 
Everybody blames the state. Well, it's the state. It's the state. Well, the state sent $500 million back to the town. So $125 million back to the local schools. $125 mm-hmm. million. Statewide. Statewide. Right. And I, I got a little report here. Just uh, we, we had it uh, just got it just the other day. Uh, in 20, what, 2021, uh, Nashville received $8.9 million from the Rooms and Meals. Mm-hmm. That's collected. You know, people that rent the room or they, they, they go out to, to dinner, right? Well, this year, 2022 to 2023, they're earmarked for a little over $14.5 million. We're sending the money back. And that was because of legislation that the Republicans did put in. Uh, uh, Senator Bouchardi uh, put in a bill making sure that that money, mm-hmm. more of that money gets earmarked back to the local municipalities. Which would tend to give the paid people here relief from some of the taxes. Right. And, and so we were talking, you started off the conversation talking a little bit about you know the, uh, you know how the rate went down, right? But there's a timing issue here too. Hmm. The reassessments went when when the market was at its peak, right? Hmm. So now what happens when when that peak dips down? Do the property taxes go down along with it? And that's well, a timing thing. And I and yeah. I wonder. And I you know I've got this jaundiced view of of intentions, you know. Yes, uh, it's, I think it's justified. Yeah, it, it, and, and so now the individuals um, that are really struggling with their with their own personal property taxes, I know we know uh, Elizabeth and, yeah. and a few others individuals, they're really struggling. Uh, do I keep my car? The elderly right. ones that don't have any new income, their income hasn't changed at all, right. If, right. unless it goes down somehow. Well, they might have gotten a little bump in their social security, oh, but that doesn't even, that doesn't even come close to the inflation rate. Yeah. I, again, I, I know I've talked about I, I, I go I go food shopping. Sure, so do I. Uncle Ben's. Un- I think I've seen you. <laughs> and you're not Uncle Ben. Uh, Uncle but, ben. you know, Uncle Ben's rice. I, there's a top shelf market basket. It used to be one a doll, a doll, five for one dollar. Now it's two fifty for one. Yeah. That's an astro- I mean, It's just one item. Right, just one item. But across the board, everything has just gone, you know, between that and your property taxes, your your energy tax, you know, consumption. Cost of energy, that's right. It's just crazy. So when we send this money back, you know, in good faith, individuals have to know it's not the state. It's not your representatives. It's not your, it's not the governor. It's not, it's not the Senate. It's your local individuals that are spending you into oblivion. They're not yeah. spending it for what it was intended. Exactly. I think we should see, the, uh, again, the uh, ability to be transparent on how the money's spent. Mm-hmm. We should see a line item in income from the state under the taxing. Uh, yeah, we have a, I did put in a bill uh, for schools that the schools have to be a little bit more countable. Uh, it's still in drafting, so I don't want to comment too much about it. But uh, we're, we're trying to make a little, really? things a little bit more transparent. Uh, yeah. Representative uh, Power uh, in, from Brookline, they uh, they want to make sure that the, the local school budgets are, are a little bit more accountable mm-hmm. to the mm-hmm. individuals because that's really where a lot of money is spent. You know, so the schools, yeah, in general, yeah, it's yeah, half it's of national school. budget, <laughs> half. half. Yeah, it's a so. huge amount of money. Yeah, and um, where does it go? And I think, how do, you, and how do you look at the money? I think the way that we used to look at it, I think the way people should look at it is what is the cost per student? Because right. you can ask the question, well, how much, how much should we spend on education? Who wants to cut back on education? Who wants there to be you know, restrictive funding on education? Nobody does. From an emotional standpoint, nobody does. But from an economic standpoint, we have to look at, at where we spend the money and where we get what kind of results. Mm-hmm. So if we look at charter schools or private schools, we find much better results for much less money on a per-student basis. So the accountability, I think, for the public schools should include some understanding and some explanation of why the cost per student is so much higher while the quality of the education, frankly, let's be honest, mm-hmm. is so much lower, at mm-hmm. least here in Nashua. It's abysmal. And anyone who says that it's good, it's not. I remember one of the aldermen in the chamber saying one time, well, we have to invest in education because when people move to a town, they're one of the biggest factors is education. Well, let me tell you, they're not moving to Nashua <laughs> because of the school system. They're not. Yeah. 
they're going to go Bedford or somewhere else, or maybe they'll come here because they like the charter schools and their charter schools are good here. Um, Very but, good. Um, the amount of money that's being spent on a per student basis is not serving families, taxpayers, students, or anybody except for some of the unions. And if you, if you look at it, what section of the, uh, the people in the school district is growing the most? It's the, uh, it's the uh, administration. Mm. Administration, you get more and more people. So, you know, the, the, our attendance is going down. Right. Slightly. The teachers have gone up slightly, mm -hmm. but the others have gone up 10 times more. Yeah. My bill will actually address a little bit of that, that uh, relative to the adoption of school administration union budget. So we'll get into more later in other segments on mm -hmm. that. But uh, that's something that uh, one of my constituents in Brookline, they really want, want to have a, a little bit more clarification on where the money's going, how it's being budgeted sure. and, and whatnot. Uh, I happened to visit uh, a charter school maybe about three, four weeks ago uh, in Salem. Mm -hmm. it, it's a music school, and it's actually it was yeah. in, at, at first I thought, okay, this doesn't. They don't have the facilities like your traditional public schools do. Uh, it is a public school, but uh, they they teach through music, mm. and I was amazed at what the, the you know they're they're. The lecturing, they're, they're, the kids are, are getting ready for, for much deeper than it was much. Honestly, it was know. just incredible yeah. with what little they have yeah. to work with. Uh, the, the kids were very bright. Uh, they, they, they get up. They're very articulate. They're very excited about uh, about their topic, their their subject, and they seem to thrive. But who'd have thought that using music as as the base for for the education system would would be uh, uh, work so well and it does and and it just goes to show that there are students that definitely learn different sure they're right. some you know audibly visually the whole nine yards but uh it's just ways that parents can say you know what my kid's not excelling in this particular school let's put him in this school mm -hmm. and and they seem to thrive at a fraction of the cost right so it's not it's not a, a matter of money right um i, I think that i've said this before but I, I, th I think it's worth pointing out again. Um, if, if, if someone is, is in an environment, a work environment, or um, the business environment of, of providing something, everyone wants more money. If you're in a competitive environment, you get more money by succeeding. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. You put out a better product, lower cost, um, increase market share, you get more money by succeeding. Mm -hmm. And if you are in a public sector, like education, where you, you're not competing. In fact, the public schools are, are trying their best to avoid competition. Monopoly. Right. You get more money by failing. That's my theory. Because they stand up there and say, you know, we missed the mark this year. We didn't do quite as good as we wanted to. But if we had more money, this is what we could do. That's been the same for years. That's how it, but that's how it works. So I think folks need to understand that because, because the public schools don't compete. Nashua doesn't compete against Bedford in education. We, we just don't compete. There's no, there's no competition for jobs, really. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, there's just no competition. And students need to be prepared to live in a competitive world. That's right. And if, if the school environment that's purporting to teach them ignores or avoids competition, what kind of example does that set? Not a good one. But if, you, if you're in an environment where you're, you get money handed to you. If you produce a great product and you do a good job, people are gonna say, well, you ha obviously you have enough. You don't need any more money. Mm -hmm. But if you come into that environment and you say, you know what, we're sorry hurting. guys, yeah. we missed the mark. Yeah. You know, we're not doing it. See, we got this issue, we got that issue. If we just had more money, guess what? You're gonna get more money. So the issue is, I think, that public schools do not compete. And that's why I think a pure voucher system would be the best because if every parent of every mm -hmm. kid in school got a voucher that they could either give yeah. to the church school, the charter school, the regular public school, home school. Everybody will compete for they it. They would have to compete for that. Right. And they would produce a much better product. Sure. But they're not in the business of competing. It's all about not competing. Yeah, and that right. will and always it, fail. It seems to be upside down. It, it, it seems as though we're here to serve the institution. Right. Versus the, the children. The whole idea is the children. And if you're in a competitive environment, 
like in the charter schools, one of the differences that's made in those charter schools is that they're there for the kids. Yeah, we really. Got, we got the science one here in, in Nashua. It's, that's it's very nationally good. recognized. It's national, yeah. 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 It's nationally recognized, and you, you ought to go there if you haven't I've been, been there. I've been there several times. It's and a great school. Aren't the, the kids are so, so uh, head up, you know, everything right. Right, with it. They, they, yeah. And speaking of budgets, though, um, you know, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I know we're talking about education right now. Uh, there are there are state workers, there are public workers that uh, you know they do deserve you know their income, and I, I know the governor is going to be uh, addressing this issue. I mean, right now, everywhere you look, uh, because of the inflation rate, because of the cost of living, uh, it, the competition for employees is is absolutely incredible, and to keep those employees, mm -hmm. and so we're we're going to have to in in this this coming budget, we're actually going to have to look at uh, some certain some salary increases. You know, it could be up to 100 million you know, uh, because we've got to be, remain competitive with all the other states. Yeah. You know, yeah. but we have a lot of uh, institutional. Uh, um, well, is that going to carry over to the schools in any way? Because I don't know about a, the schools per se. The unions because, are so uh, c controlling. They don't yeah. want to have any difference. You know, uh, I remember way back when I went to school, some of the star teachers got a, more of a salary. Mm -hmm. They were not according to the regular. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is just you, you march according to this formula. I think that uh, the, the, the teachers may, may be more of a local issue rather, but we're talking about state workers, you know, the, you know, pe people that are working for the, for the state. Uh, we're having a, a very difficult time with retention of employees yeah. Yeah. Uh, across mm -hmm. the board. And, and it's just not the, the public sector, it's the, the private sector as well. So, you know, this... This trickle up effect, if you will, of inflation is 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 hurting mm. everybody. And the problem is, you go to solve it, it you're, you're also raising the cost of living. So where does this end? You, yeah. You've got to come down. We, we've got to uh, come up with some new ideas. I yeah. think it it ends with competition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not saying that some of those workers don't deserve more money. I'm not saying that at all. And if they're leaving, clearly someone else is paying them more. Right. But just to touch base, I think it's important that folks at home understand how much an average Nashua teacher makes. When I was on the Board of Aldermen and those new contracts would come out, um, we looked at the all-up costs because the union or some of the teacher favor or the union mm -hmm. favoring aldermen will say, well, look, it's only this much in salary. It's only this much. But you have to factor in the all-up mm -hmm. cost. So when I was on the board, and that was a number of years ago now, the all-up cost for a teacher, an average teacher, that's across 1,000 teachers, was about $100,000. Mm -hmm. And the all-up cost at the charter school, which outperforms the national right. public school, was about 80000 per teacher. So clearly, to hire a good teacher, you can hire a good teacher for $80,000. Mm -hmm. um, yet these teachers are, are making, and that's, that's the job of the union, to make sure that their rank and file get more money than the market would yeah. otherwise command. $80,000 is not a bad salary, in right. my opinion. Right. Um, but if we have 1,000 teachers and you take $20,000 extra per 1,000 teachers, mm -hmm. that comes out to $20 million more per year on the, Nash on the back of the national taxpayer. And you get a pension on top of that. Well, no, it, that's included. Okay. It's every, that's the all-up cost, the all-up. That, that's a huge difference. So if every student in Nashua were to go to a charter school, the city of Nashville would save $20 million a year on teacher salaries alone. Forget about the rest of it. Um, but, but that's- Saving this, the money is one thing, but it, it would, oh, then would the local officials say, oh, we got more money to spend on something else. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem. You Probably. send it back to them and they say, oh, look what we yeah. got. Let's do something that's else. That's because our federal government isn't a very good example. Oh, no. They're a lousy money. example. I, I want to be clear, too. You know, I'm not, I'm not anti-teacher, right? I'm not anti-teacher. I'm anti-public union because what they do is, is, reduce is take away competition you take right. away competition you no longer have efficiencies right. competition brings efficiencies it brings better profit better everything mm -hmm. like we spoke about earlier mm -hmm. so it's, it's the it's the the public unions that do not compete and frankly are deadly afraid deathly afraid of competing they mm -hmm. don't want to compete mm -hmm. and that's the thing at least if if gm and ford both have unions well Someone's going to buy a Ford. Someone's going to buy a GM, right? So there's there's still some competition. So the union has to participate indirectly in a competitive market. Right. 
but the public unions do not participate in a competitive market. Mm -hmm. um, they're supposed to be multiple sellers and multiple buyers. And what the unions make sure of is that there's multiple buyers and one seller. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they monopolize it. And I think that's, that's hugely detrimental to people. And, Definitely. you know, the, the, the frog in the beaker analogy, you know, you turn the heat up a little bit all the time and pretty soon frogs cook, but nobody yep. cares. And that's what's <laughs> happening with public, with taxes. Sure. Yeah. You know, the heat goes up in the beaker and the poor frog, he just, uh, it's not so bad. Uh, it's not so bad. Uh, it's not so bad. Pretty soon you're done. You're done. Yeah. And, and I you think got, you it got, is bad. You got to evaluate by competition. Yeah. yeah. Performance. Performance yeah. is compete. Yeah, and well, we do have a lot of people that are concerned. We have uh, people that are speaking up, and uh, it's good to speak up. Don't be afraid. You have to. If you don't, then then you, you're just going to get uh, more of the same. Uh, well, yeah. some of these examples are popping up more frequently now. Just the one down at the uh, the one that didn't uh, uh, give the uh, students who won the uh, the national awards uh, direct. Uh, uh, a celebration, uh, you know, for them, what they did. They just handed out a piece of paper. This was your, you, you were, uh, you were up, at, up in this ranking. Mm -hmm. And uh, why did he do that? He didn't want to hurt the, pe the people yeah. that weren't getting it. Well, uh, people should stand up and speak up. And I think it's important that folks understand too that if you mm -hmm. stand up and speak up, you're not, you're not alone, really. Mm -hmm. I think there's, there's perceived risk. I don't want to be the guy who stands mm -hmm. up. You know the. Um, there's an adage, I spent some time in China years ago, and, and the adage there was that the nail that sticks up is the one that gets hammered down. Mm -hmm. So no one wants to be the one that sticks up, mm -hmm. whether you're in China or standing in front of a microphone in the school board meeting. You don't want to be the nail that sticks up. But I think that um, there are people with talking about right to know, and they're asking questions and looking for information, and um, they're, they're getting some progress sometimes, but they're also getting help. They're yeah. not there alone. Yeah, we have. I do have a constituent. She's been uh, looking for uh, a right to know request, and today's actually the deadline. And uh, we, I told her to contact the attorney general on, on top of that, right. because it seems as though they it, it's well. How far can we let this go? You know, well, they're, they're either incompetent, they get away with. they're either incompetent, or they're hiding something, or they just don't care. They don't I care. don't see any other option. No, because, I don't either. Uh, the, the, the Department of Bureaucracy is supposed to be there to serve the people, not to uh, lord over them. But you know, you brought up an interesting point about that, that perspective of China. That same perspective that China had with you know that, that nail that sticks up gets gets uh, gets banged. I just started reading the the, uh, the gulag from Archipelago, mm. and uh, a couple of lessons that I've learned so far from what I'm reading, and listening to some of the the, the, the podcasts about the book. It's basically three volumes, six hundred pages, you know, per volume. But uh, this general, uh, not general, this, this guy who was a captain in, in Stalin's uh, military, happened to write a letter. And uh, little did he know that all the letters were being read, and he was just that much critical of Stalin. Mm. Well, sure enough, in, in the middle of the night, uh, knock, 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 uh, you're under arrest. Uh, he spoke up, but actually in secret, he just kind of made it a little, little gesture, and he got arrested. But as I'm reading the book and listening to the, the, what, what he's talking about in his experiences, he comes, with the, he comes up with the word if. If I only spoke up when it was uncomfortable mm. and not dangerous. Mm. If you only spoke up when it was uncomfortable and not dangerous, I wouldn't be here where I'm at. At the end of his 10 year or 11 year in, this, in, in the gulag, he came to the conclusion while he's laying on a bed of straw, all this suffering mm. was my fault. Mm. And it was, it was a catharsis, it was liberating to him. He said, I, through my decision making of staying quiet, allowed all this persecution to happen to me mm. because I was afraid to be the little nail, if you will, I'm paraphrasing that. Mm -hmm to stick up. And then he said, you know, you got to stop and think back now. Everybody's blaming Stalin and, and Hitler for all the, the wicked things that happened. Mm, right. But they were just one man. It took an entire society to be quiet. Yeah. To look the other way. 
to be afraid to stand up for what was right, for what they knew was wrong, uh, and, and to be counted was, was something they shunned. And that mm -hmm. allowed these evil people to do the great harm to hundreds of millions of people, suffering in, 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 in millions of deaths. Now, we're talking local stuff, right? I mean, I, I'm getting wicked deep. Yeah. But it starts somewhere. Yeah. And, you know, when somebody comes up and says, you know, uh, Senator Avard, I want you to, to, to look at this or I want you to look at that. Uh, from time to time, I'll turn back and I'll say, you know, got it. I agree with you. By the way, thanks for speaking up. Thanks for speaking up. It's important to speak up. And, and yes, it matters locally. And, you know, there are going to be a lot of people that, uh, you know, we talk about bullying in school. Well, you've been on social media. Mm. <laughs> you know, yeah, but well, it's okay. You can take it if you're right. You don't have to worry about what other people say. What I was looking for here is uh, what they did in Texas. I think if you read that, what Abbott had done now, the governor, and he has the parental bill of rights. Yeah. So that uh, now he says that this is going to be law, that the parent has the right to control what happens to their children. And right. why would anybody in the right mind think that? Yeah. On, only somebody with, with uh, evil intentions, as, as far as I'm concerned. Well, it's well it started happening. Yeah. And then it only came to Abbott's attention right. because people started complaining about it. Right. And, and he came to their aid and to their rescue. And I think that's what governors across the country should do. Yeah. So that if there's an issue, if parents need to stand up about any things that were in here, whether it's the curriculum or you know CRT or mm -hmm. gender stuff that doesn't belong there, things that belong um, under the purview of the parents, not the teacher, then um, that that should be common sense. Right. But when when governors start seeing that kind of thing happen, they should enact laws. And like he's, this. Done, he's laws gone like even this. further. He's going to change the state's constitution yeah. to make sure that this. Right is it just is right in the Constitution. Yeah, I know that and there's posted some, and all the rest of it. Right. There's some people looking at that here in New Hampshire as Good. far as uh, parental rights bill. I, I think Senator Ennis and a few others uh, also there'll be some but people in the House. You have to react to other things now. Yeah. They take one that's very obvious: that your most treasure is your children. Yep. Yeah. And you want to go on? What What else is next? Okay, mm -hmm. it's the welfare of the town or the, the your neighbors, the whole neighborhood, let's make sure that they have the right to complain without somebody doing something to them in, in cases. I mean, you look in the cases of uh, Nashua, a couple of people were fired here in the city because they helped out too much with the people who were asking questions. Yeah, 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 yeah that's wrong. Yeah, and so the fear of government is it, it's 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 upside down. It, it, the government's supposed to fear the people, mm -hmm. in, in in that uh, well, I better live up to what I said I was going to do and, and to the constitution. Otherwise, I'm going to lose my job. Uh, you know, I, I my, think in the schools that they're also afraid of losing their pension. That's another one. Yeah, yeah. you get out, you'll be, you can't. You get fired, you lose your pension. Yeah, my uh, my assistant today got a call for she serves one of the other senators as well. And uh, one of his constituents called, and uh, it was a child, apparently, and calling uh, about how he co-sponsored the bill uh, with the, uh, the transgender bathrooms and, and whatnot, and how that uh, they want to keep it uh, same sex in, 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 you know, two X's in, in one bathroom, X, two X's in one Y in another bathroom, mm -hmm. male and female. Uh, and the, the child uh, called and complained that uh, it was discriminating against the transgenders, but um, we we'll quickly to point out. Well, what about those that uh, are are uh, 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 female or a male? Uh, what about their rights mm -hmm. uh, and not being feeling comfortable in in uh, not to mention that they're more in, a, in number. Yeah, well, it, the, more in number, but it, but the, the thing is, is well, what about their offenses? Yeah, why, their why, rights. Uh, they are. How was that taken? How, well, uh, no answer, and mm -hmm. uh, I, then she just kind of hung up. Yeah, um, but. You know, and it was but she was. This person was probably fed that argument by somebody. Somebody must have said something, and uh, they said, "Well, uh, how would you know?" I, I don't know how the, the student knew about the bill in the first place. But that being said, yeah. Um, uh, hey, she spoke up. 
Uh, but it was also met with a little bit of, well, well, what about these other people's rights? You know, what about the women that are uncomfortable mm-hmm. with men being in, in, in the bathroom? Mm-hmm. Or, or, you know, or it, it, you know, it's time. It's time to speak up. And, and a lot right. of, nobody's, a, you know, if you want to be a transgender, that's your right. Mm-hmm. But where people are starting to really solidly put on the brakes is when you start talking about my kid. Yeah. That's when the brakes come on. That's when, that's when things start to change. Mm-hmm. That's when the whole thing starts, okay, enough. Enough is enough. It, it's your business, whatever you're going to do in your privacy, but don't force this on the kids. But they need to because that's, that's the goal. The goal is to change culture and to, to completely overturn the culture because that's, I think, how they plan to usher in their socialist utopia. Yeah. Um, by by completely upsetting mm-hmm. our economy, mm-hmm. which we're seeing happen, by completely upsetting our social structure and the family, completely upsetting and controlling education, as we've been speaking about, these things are happening in the school because mm-hmm. they want to raise those kids mm-hmm. outside of the parents' mm-hmm. supervision yeah. to live differently, to live more according to that, to be more accepting of of government control when the time comes. Right. So, yeah, stand up. Don't do it. We don't send our son to public school. For that very reason. Right. Well, and, and just you have to remember about government, it changes every two years. Mm. You know, and so that means the, the mores, the morale, the, the moral compass uh, is, is, on, is on shifting sand all the time. Mm-hmm. And so uh, what is truth? You know, Pilate said that, right? What is truth? And then that becomes the question of the day. What's the zeitgeist? What's the spirit of the day? Where will the crowds be led this way or will they be led that way? And, and after a while, you know, if you watch any of the nature shows, again, I, I, this is how I think anyway. You know, you look in the sky, you see the birds, they all flock together. And they do that in numbers. And part of that is for protection. You look on, on, under the water, you see the, the swirls and the, the swarms of fish. And sometimes those swarms get put in this group so the predators can come and pick you off one by one by one by one. And after a while, that big pile of just what you thought were safety in numbers turns to be dwindled, and you're, you're at the control of other people. And uh, mm. it, it, it's good to speak up. It's good to stand out. It's good to say, hey, look, this, this isn't logical. This isn't right. And right. I, for one, want to stand up and be counted. I don't want to be lying on a bed of straw 10, 15 years from now saying, you know, yeah. if I'd only spoke up, mm. yeah. if I'd only not listened to the crowd and just got out of my comfort zone, why are my taxes going up so high? Why aren't you telling the people where the money's going with in, in, in the city? What are you spending it on? Why are you waiting so much time, taking so much time on these right to know requests for people that want to know how you came to the evaluation of their trailer? Of their trailer? Mm-hmm. What, are they, just because they're in a trailer, they're not, they're not important? You know, they don't live in this m- m- big, big mansion? There's a problem. And it's time that the people speak up, you know, and if you're, if you're suffering, it's okay. And you might, you might get some resistance. That's life. That's life. That's what I've learned that that's life and uh, run for office. You'll see what I mean. <laughs> but those folks can also appeal because they don't have to be alone. Right. They don't they're, have not to be, alone. they're not alone. They're not alone. So it isn't like they're, they're the one nail. There's a, a lot of nails that are sticking up, and you can join that and, and, and not and, get hammered down. I know I get a little f- philosophical, too, but like you said, they're not alone. But what happens is when people start to, to clam up, they stifle themselves, right? Mm. Uh, and then, you know, in that, in that book, there, it talks about how that, you know, well, one neighbor rats out another neighbor, another neighbor rats out another neighbor, and they just all stay quiet. Mm-hmm. Right. And nobody says anything out of fear something bad's going to happen to them. That's right. And the problem is, because they're quiet, something bad happens to them. They get that 3 o'clock knock in the morning. So Uh, let me see your papers, please. So what do we do to get people to get together and form a a stronger um, group? Well, I think one of, one of the things is like what we're doing right now. We're we're volunteers. Mm-hmm. We're volunteer senator. We're volunteer TV people. Uh, we're, we're engaged. Uh, you're still, you know, volunteering your time. You got uh, your organizations in Nashua 
or whether it's the GOP, uh, I think we're a very open group. Mm -hmm. uh, those are things that you can do. You can go to the school board meeting, mm -hmm. go and ask questions. Uh, go to your your um, go to your town meetings or your city meetings. Those are important. Watch them on TV if you if you can't go. Yeah, I would say on, on that you don't even have to ask a question. Just go. Yeah. If if you're sitting, I'm telling you, when I was on the board of aldermen, you could tell if that gallery was full. Well, people took notice. If the gallery wasn't full, yeah. whatever. Some people come to to the Capitol. And they got the cameras. And let's just sit in the front row. Hey, I'm watching you. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't intimidate me. It, no. but, but it's like, Sure, okay. because you're not trying to hide anything. No, you don't have to. Right. We're on video anyway. Sure. But, uh, but just folks should go. They don't have to stand at the microphone and they speak. They don't have to listen, stand. Listen, listen, listen. And then maybe one day, then maybe one day you say something. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But I understand, you know, not wanting to stand at the microphone, but you don't have to. Nobody Just has to be there. Be there. Get some people that are like minded and you all go together and yeah. you sit there and listen. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, yeah. And, and bring bring your camera. It's great. It's, you know, sure. Uh, for real. Uh, they'll yeah. take notice and they'll watch their P's and Q's. But they you will. notice That's some right. of the things that are happening here again in Nashua is the time that they give the people to talk who want to talk. Oh, my God. It's gosh. very brief. And now it's limited to just items on the agenda. Well, what the heck? They have no control over the agenda. My, their item may never be up there, so how can I talk about it? Right, and that's a little different in, in the Senate, in, in one of our committees. Sure. We are, um, are agenda-driven because of, of particular bills and times. Mm -hmm. But whether it's this town or some neighboring towns that I've gone to, you have two minutes to speak. Um, really? Try to, try to get out. Uh, yeah. a, a few ideas in, in two minutes without feeling that pressure and the crowd and mm -hmm. the clock and, and yeah. the fact that you're speaking and if you're not a normal, you know, if you're not a, a professional speaker in front of a, a body of individuals that are they're not, they're not smiling at you, they're just <laughs> looking at you. Yeah, it, it's intimidating. It's and really yeah. intimidating. It's meant to be intimidating. And when I was on the Board of Law, we didn't have those rules. I mean, there was the, there was the um, um, public comment at the beginning of the meeting, public comment at the end. Right. Public comment at the beginning was supposed to be on matters that were on the agenda, and the agenda is published. Um, at the end was for whatever you wanted to talk about. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I got involved was because I thought that part of our process as Americans is great. Yeah. Right. To listen to what people have, to get people, give them a chance to say what is on their mind. And... Um, what are the characteristics of good government? What mm -hmm. are those characteristics? One of the characteristics of good government, I think, is for people to know and believe that they are heard. Right. And if they believe and know and believe that they're not, and whether it's in City Hall or in a state house, wherever these mm -hmm. restrictions are being mm -hmm. put upon them, and certainly that's happening at City Hall and the school board um, here in Nashua, it's telling people, look, your opinion, you just, you out there in the public, we're giving you this time because it's required by law and decency, but we're not really going to listen to you. Right. And, and that's, and that's it, wrong. It's tragic. You know, and I, yeah. I uh, applaud the governor yesterday for, for a statement that he made because uh, it, it, it's a real, it's a truism that, you know, there, there are times where you have to step out of your echo chamber. Hmm. And, and uh, he was saying, you know, there are a lot of people that, that feel very comfortable in your echo chamber because it's, it's like praise going out and it's coming right back at right. you. It's when you step out of that comfort zone and you take some of the heat and you have to have an open mind and listen to the other side and, uh, you know, take some criticism uh, or, 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 you know, you got to bite the bullet and, and kind of compromise a little bit because, you know, you're not going to get your own way. When you do that, then everybody's being served. But if you're living in your own echo chamber, what happens is you're not living in reality. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. As though, as much as, as smart as you think you are, as, as as, uh, as wonderful as it sounds, uh, and the fact that you have people agreeing about you all the time. And I thought that was, uh, that was a very good statement. And uh, of course, I'm sitting right next to uh, Senator Waters when, when he's doing this. <laughs> so, you know, you know, we're doing this, you know, but it, it, it's true uh, because we're on both sides of the aisle. You know, he's, he's Democrat, I'm, I'm Republican, but... Uh, How does he feel about public comment? Oh, yeah, he definitely welcomes it. Oh, absolutely. That's the way it should yeah, be. And, and, uh, and we definitely have dialogue, and it's funny, We'll sit down after after a committee hearing, and uh, you know it's like everybody's walking out, and it's okay. He he takes the professorship 
stance, you know. <laughs> so, Kevin, you know, and, and we'll have a nice conversation. Uh, and, I, and I'll bounce some things off him because he is a professor. I mean, he's a very intelligent man. However, there are some issues which were like, you know, universes apart, and they'll never come together, and we don't have to dwell on that. You know, mm -hmm. we can dwell on things that, uh, that complement each other or that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, help us reach our goals. And, and one of them is, of course, you know, lowering the cost of electricity, thinking outside the box, uh, you know, making, making it more affordable. And for, you can learn a lot sometimes. Yeah. You yeah, sure can. Don't, don't be afraid uh, of uh, hearing something that uh, no, that's right. justifies. Fact, I, I bounced that book off him because I know he's, he's a well-read individual. I said, so, hey, Senator, did you read that book? The uh, Gulag of Archipelago? He goes, oh, yes. And then, of course, it was a, it was a nice little conversation. And I, I brought up one little, one little section. I think it was like page 68 or 69, where uh, Stalin does a speech. And everybody gets up and starts clapping for him. Mm. Two minutes, three minutes, seven minutes, ten minutes. Right. No <laughs> one wants to be the first to sit down. Nobody wants to be the first to sit down. <laughs> and so one gentleman, the senior gentleman, passes out. But the first person who stops clapping, you know, guess who comes knocking at their yeah, door? That's right. KJV, uh, you were the first one to stop clapping. Yeah. But that's fear. Yeah, I know. That's you right. Know? But, uh, and I, I brought that up, and we, we both started laughing a little bit about it. But uh, it, it's uh, getting out of the, you know, making sure that you recognize that the individual that you might not always agree with is still created in the image of God. They're human beings, and you can have dialogue. And when you lose sight of that, it's time to look in the mirror. Well, I think that you raise an interesting point there. Um, I think that the, the totalitarian states, they set themselves up as God. There's no higher authority. Right. And the way the United States was formed with the self-government that we have, the idea is that no matter what level you're at, there is a higher authority. You're endowed with, it, with your, your rights from the Creator. That's right. That's where it comes from. And I think in America, we're losing sight of that. I think mm -hmm. the left intentionally is taking that away so that the public's attention or reverence is changed from being towards God towards being towards. And those little changes. Little changes. That come along. Frog in a beaker. people are going to be. You're focused only on the government. Right. And that's what, what it was like under Stalin. That's what it was like under, under Mao Zedong, too, in China. Yeah. Same kind of thing. So they set themselves up that way, and there's no higher authority. But in our representative system, in the, our system that the founding fathers established, even the president, mm -hmm. every single person out there at that time that. Yeah. recognized that they were responsible, we, responsible and accountable to someone who was ultimately going to judge. Yeah. Not just, even if the voters were fooled, the judge was not. I was in, in my office when uh, a particular vote came, just, it was just this week, and uh, has to do with the rules of the House and all. Uh, apparently, the Democrats wanted to get rid of the prayer before mm. um, session. Right. Um, because it was an inclusive. Right, it's offensive, yeah. It, it, it's offensive, but again, um, it, this is a tradition that we've handed down, you don't have to say anything. Right. You know, if you, if, if you want to have a moment of silence while somebody's praying, that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's your prerogative. Uh, if you want to know, acknowledge there's a being that is transcendent, uh, you know, beyond, uh, beyond our comprehension, well, that's okay too. Yeah, but they don't want to do any of that. But that brings you again. That brings to your argument. Well, if, if there's if there's somebody who's we're, who's transcendent that we're accountable to, uh, who uh, may, uh, ultimately will judge us uh, according to our our, our deeds, uh, well, then that that might change our behavior and our intentions on certain things. But if there's nobody there, if we're just an accident, yeah. If we're just an accident, then we just exploded. Then. What's I don't right, think the folks wrong? that are advocating that really believe it. Yeah, I think that they're 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 trying to convince everyone else around them that there's nothing. It's and, a new moral standard. It's a, yeah, it's a higher in their mind standard of of morality. See, I, I'm more inclusive, and, right? And, and so that trumps this whole idea of you praying to a singularity. But they're also trying to justify the deception they've played on themselves. If they can get a big group to mm -hmm. go along, mm -hmm. they can justify in their mind the deception that they've played on themselves. And that's, what they're, that's, that's the piece that they're trying to find. Mm -hmm. And it's never gonna work because they're, if they feel there might be some accountability, it's not because I say so, it's because deep inside they know it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they're trying to crush what they deep inside know and fear. 
Yeah. And they're trying to crush it for everybody. Yeah, um, uh, a guy named R.C. Sproul mentioned something to that effect. That oh, it's, yeah. It's not a, an intellectual thing. It's a, it's a moral decision. But that's where he, he would lay the foundation for the beginning of his arguments. Yeah. And then he would uh, speak about a book in the, uh, the Bible, of Romans chapter 1 or something to that effect. Yeah. R.C. Sproul is a great guy. Yeah. So getting back to, uh, you know, this whole idea of being inclusive, speaking up, uh, challenging your local uh, officials uh, on you know, hey, where's it going? Where's the money going, man? Mm -hmm. You know, hey, all the money that went to Ukraine, where's it going? Where's the money? That's another topic. Yeah, uh, but where's it going? Well, where's it going? And and why isn't it going to our borders? Why isn't it protecting us here? Speak up. It's okay. You got friends. Uh, you're not alone. And nobody's, you know, there's, there's people out there that are willing to uh, agree with you. Yeah, you might have an echo chamber. Uh, there might be some people that will have a different bent on it. But... Um, I think to answer your question, you know, what can people locally do? Well, they can show up, like David said, mm -hmm. show up at the events, uh, call up, write a letter, send an email. Uh, and now it's the beginning of the year. We're going to have all these meetings and stuff. Yeah. This is your chance to go to the meetings, the committee meetings, the subcommittee meetings, mm -hmm. uh, anything else that you th have some concerns about and get it out and don't be afraid of going and asking for more information. Yeah, and, and sometimes it's, it's okay not to come with a hammer yeah. in your hand. Uh, uh, yeah, just come to sit there and listen. Yeah, or you know, if, if, if you feel somebody's a rhino, or if you feel somebody's a, uh, you know, a lefty, or, or, you, know, you don't have to start off that way. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, there's a good book, it's called How to Win Friends and Influence People. You know, <laughs> try to <laughs> be agreeable at yeah. some point, but uh, yeah. come alongside somebody instead of, uh, yeah, definitely you want to confront when, when the time is right, but uh, don't already come with a spear in your hand saying, okay, you know, we're, I, I'm, I'm engaged in a battle. But by that point, it's too late. Start well, the conversation I think, early. Yeah, start the conversation early. And I think that the other side has, the left has, has made it into a battle mm -hmm. because we're through the intimidation. So 